thank you yeah. so, yeah, so yeah. much. Okay, yay. Okay, we're all cozy. Okay, ready? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the board briefing for the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. Commissioner Cecilia Jayapal and Commissioner Lori Stegman are excused today. Um, audience members, just a reminder to silence your electronic devices. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. Today's first briefing is on the Government Relations 2023 Legislative Session. Good morning and welcome. Um, I will have to say getting this Legislative update is one of my, my favorite parts of the briefing, um, both as it reminds me of my time in the legislature, but also because there are so many um, important issues and budget decisions that have such a huge impact for Multnomah County. And um, we know that things are getting increasingly complicated for the county, for our communities, and um, these are issues where we really need the partnership and the work of the state to, to, to help us as we are working on those. Um, this session, I think, especially was a complicated one, and so I just wanna thank all of you who are here for all of the work that you did in um, making sure that Multnomah County priorities um, didn't, didn't get um, pushed aside with all of the conversations, the walkouts, the rush at the end to make decisions. Um, so I really appreciate all of all of your um, work in that today. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Justin. Thank Great. you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, Justin Black is he, him pronouns. I'm the Director of Government Relations here at Multnomah County. And with me, I have... Uh, Stacy Callen, I use she, her pronouns, uh, Senior State Policy Manager here at Multnomah County. And Taylor Steenblock, she, her pronouns as well, State and Regional Affairs for the County. Um, and first of all, uh, just to note, um, you'll notice the cover of our legislative uh, session and review document this year is a picture of the Burnside Bridge, which was a prize uh, for Taylor Steenblock um, because at the onset of the legislative session, we did not believe we were gonna get any money uh, for the Burnside Bridge and had set a very low bar on that, but she was able through dogged determination to get uh, funding for Burnside Bridge, a piece of the funding, um, and she will talk about that later. Um, but if we go to the next slide. I think you stole my thunder. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, today we will do um, you know, a, a session recap. Um, we will talk about the 2023 uh, legislative agenda that the board voted on in December. Um, we will go through each of the issue areas uh, to make sure that we touch on all the highlights. This is not a comprehensive every bill presentation. This is an overview of some of the highlights and some of the bigger bills. We are always available to talk and dive deeper into individual bills as commissioners or staff want to. Um, we also produce a much longer legislative review document. It's 20 some pages that dives deeper into a number of bills, um, but just wanna put that out there that we are always available. Uh, next slide. So first, um, a broad overview on the legislative session. This was the first uh, in-person session in three years. Um, there was a huge turnover in elected officials. Um, as you know, we had a speaker um, who had presided over the last short session, but this was his first long session. We had a new Senate president, and of course we had a new governor. Um, also within the rank and file, nine of the Multnomah County um, nine of the 25 Multnomah County legislators were brand new this legislative session. So this is a, a lot of new legislators in the building, a lot of educational time by us, helping them understand the role that county governments play, especially Multnomah County as a, you know, a payer and a provider of safety net programs. Um, we did a lot of get to know your county uh, meetings with legislators as well as issue advocacy and budget advocacy. Um, a third of the house members were also brand new statewide, or sorry, a third of all members, sorry, a third of House members who were new this legislative session. So it was a lot of new faces in the building and just a lot of get to know you time. Uh, in addition, construction was happening uh, during session. So all of the space was truncated basically to in front of the um, uh, uh, committee hearings, so it was really hard to get time and space with legislators because um, they were they were just compacted into one area. Um, 
Also, as we walked into the legislative session, it's important to remember that in November, the revenue forecast uh, said that recession now most likely scenario. Um, we were walking into the legislative session really uh, poised to fight against cuts. Um, and that's where we were talking, to, that's what we were talking to legislators about, and that's what we spent most of the time talking about. It wasn't until May uh, when we started experiencing the whiplash. Um, when the new revenue forecast came out, it turned out that they had $2 billion more than expected. Uh, this created just a stampede of asks, not only from us, but every other advocacy organization in the building. Um, at that same time, we were experiencing the longest walkout ever in Oregon, um, which made it even more difficult because you had a number of Republican senators out of the building um, who were unable to advocate for issues. Um, you had a lot of budget decisions happening behind closed doors, making it even harder uh, to advocate for issues. So we are working with all of this in the backdrop. At the end, though, I think a number of really positive policy packages happened. Um, we were able to get some budget wins, like the aforementioned bridge. We were able to see some success, but I will tell you, in the long time I've been doing this, there has never been such a whiplash uh, during session of going from cuts to all of a sudden having a $2 billion surplus and watching everybody react to that. So quite the session. Next slide, and I will hand it to Stacy. Yeah, thank you, Justin. So each session, our goal really is to represent the interests of the boards and departments. We serve as the main point of contact for our state electeds and really trying to use a unified voice. Um, uh, in that space. Um, next slide. So as a reminder, we wanted to share the legislative agenda that the board adopted in December. Um, as Justin mentioned, we are a safety net payer and a provider in our community, and that really drives a lot of the work that we do in Salem. Expanding services for those who are most vulnerable in our community and making sure that the safety net is robustly funded in a way that's sustainable and can meet folks' needs. Uh, next slide, please. This is the remainder of our agenda. You can see we've got a lot of interests, a lot of priorities keeping us incredibly busy in Salem. Uh, next slide. So just a few highlights. I won't read this list uh, directly to you. I think we'll have a report coming out pretty soon that has a lot more information on many of these items. But I did just want to reiterate some of what Justin said. I think the budget was a major factor this session in determining how these investments came through for the county as well as everybody else engaging in the legislative process. So we saw a lot of people funded at current service level or slightly above that service level. Um, but we didn't really see any major shifts for the baseline funding for these programs. Most of them were sort of focused on what do you need for the next biennium to be successful and to make this program um, serve the needs that it has been serving uh, to this point. So um, I will say, though, we did have some policy wins this session, too. We saw um, abortion access increase. We saw some gun regulation. Also, um, a piece I've been working on, I think, since I've been in this position, the Juvenile Detention Education Program, we both needed a funding and a policy fix for that program. We got about half of the policy fix for that program, so we'll be coming back for the rest, but um, chipping away at that. So we did have some good policy work that occurred despite the work, the walkout as well. But um, these really, this is really a list of all of the funding that we saw come through. And that whiplash really created sort of this rush to the end where everybody was hoping to get money for their side projects. So we saw a lot of other projects like Burnside get some funding as well. Um, but for the programmatic piece, we saw a lot of ser uh, current service level. Next slide. So coming into session, uh, Governor Kotech, newly elected Governor Kotech, had identified housing and homelessness as a top priority. And you'll recall on day one, she declared a homelessness state of emergency. We were really pleased to see this package move early in session, and that is a little unprecedented. You don't usually see um, uh, folks coming together so quickly and moving up such a robust package. Um, this package provided $200 million to meet the goal of reducing unsheltered homeless individuals across um, Oregon. Um, and we'll talk through a couple of these individual pieces. Uh, obviously, there was a, a bulk of funding that was directed right at the Tri-County area in uh, the metro region. And of course, importantly, rent assistance is something that we tracked really closely. Uh, next slide, please. 
So House Bill 5511 is the budget bill for Oregon Housing and Community Services. The allocations in this agency budget really built on those early investments. And of course, this passed much later in session. So there was a lot of conversation about what are the additional investments we need, not just to react to the um, uh, state of emergency, but really to uh, build up the state agency and services uh, for the two-year two biennium. Um, one item, again, I'll note has to do with rent assistance. Uh, we actually came into session asking for a total of $100 million for rent assistance, just general rent assistance. We recognize the importance of homelessness prevention, and that's such a key piece to keeping families stable. You'll see that there was $55 million in OHCS's budget for rent assistance. This built on approximately $30 million from the early investment, so we did come out of session about $19 million short. Um, rent assistance is a really difficult conversation. It is an incredibly large uh, line item, and again, it's prevention dollars. So um, we will continue, I think, talking about the importance of this in future sessions, and I think there might be some additional discussions in the short session about whether there's um, uh, interest in need uh, to fund this item. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on the health front, um, just a couple things. Um, so the uh, Senate Bill 5525 was the bill that funded uh, many OHA programs and many of our health programs, uh, or OHA programs that filtered down to the county. Uh, the first, the $138 million in general fund for the Medicaid demonstration waiver, that is the match that the state needed to implement their new Medicaid benefits. It's the housing benefit, the food benefit, and the climate change benefit. Um, it's important to remember that um, those benefits actually have a dollar cap um, per year. It's about $250 million per year. Um, so OHA is gonna slowly roll out those benefits to make sure that they don't go past that $250 million uh, benefit cap. Um, and they'll do that by restricting the populations that are eligible for those benefits um, and limiting some of those benefits initially. Um, in addition, there was a $37 million investment in behavioral health. This is on top of current service level. This also, it was not as large as we were asking for, but it's still a pretty good investment in behavioral health. There's seven million dollars for um, CMHPs dealing with civil commitment issues. Um, that will uh, be distributed via formula to counties, so we roughly will get uh, about 1.5 million of that over the biennium, um, which is not a huge amount of money, but it is an increase in dollars towards providing services to individuals who are civilly committed. Um, in addition, there was $15 million in general fund to increase um, capacity in the SUD system. This is largely around um, construction and facility costs. This is not an increase in the payment that substance use providers will get. Um, so this is a capital uh, investment. Um, we still are unclear on how these dollars are going to be distributed. In the past, they have leaned on a granting application process for dollars like this. We assume they're going to go the same direction, but have not yet heard how they're going to distribute those monies. Um, in addition, um, there was um, overall $50 million invested in public health modernization. This has been a 10-year process of investing in public health. Um, we are still not to a full investment of public health um, modernization yet. Um, you might remember the late great Mitch Greenlick started this process uh, with an evaluation of the state's public health uh, system and found that uh, 10 years ago, it was $100 million underinvested. Um, through COVID, it has shown that it is, that, that gap is even greater. Um, so going into the legislative session, the ask was $100 million. 286. Sorry, 286. <laughs> and then 150. Um, and then by the end of session, got down to $80 million. So it is still an increase in public health, um, but it is not quite where we would like to see the state uh, in investing in public health. Um, in addition, there was expansion in the Medicaid program to the Healthier Oregon program that will expand services to individuals who would otherwise be eligible uh, for Medicaid um, except for their immigration status. So we will see um, more people have access to the Medicaid program. Next slide. 
I'm gonna call out a couple of the bills here and then um, Stacy will finish it up. But I think the first is um, House Bill 2513. This was the bill to help um, reorganize the distribution of the ballot measure 110 dollars. Um, as you re may remember, um, after ballot measure 110 passed, um, local governments were actually the um, provider of last resort um, for receiving any of the funds available through ballot measure 110. We were able to get on an even playing field um, last legislative session, um, but through the granting process, we realized there was a lot of deficits in how the or how OHA was organizing the distribu distribution of those funds. One of those uh, gaps was coordination with local substance use programs. So we were able to get some language inserted in the statute that would require burns um, and local governments coordinate better um, with what services they are providing. Um, we also um, added a significant number of um, clarifying language around how funds should be distributed, like including an appeals process um, if someone is denied funds uh, through their through the granting process, um, better defining um, the board makeup and also the ethics around um, how the board ap approached the granting process, and then also just the overall granting process, giving um, the Oversight Council some actual dedicated staff so they can do this in a more professional, long-term way. Um, Next, I will go to um, House Bill 2543, which is actually one of our misses this legislative session. We were hoping to get uh, some funds allocated to require OHA to evaluate um, the CMHP system to make sure that there was funding, adequate funding available for counties and local mental health authorities to provide the services that were required under statute. Um, there's long been a push pull between um, local providers and OHA around the funds needed to provide these services. Um, at the end of the day, um, OHA decided it was going to cost them over a million dollars to do this study. Um, that killed it at the end of session, um, largely because of the timing of the walkout and the inability to really advocate uh, for these dollars. So the bill didn't happen. We are trying to work with OHA to implement some of the studies to actually figure out how much it costs the county to provide civil commitment uh, programs, uh, aid and assist programs, m many of those programs. So we will continue to work on those. Um, and then House Bill 2757, which was setting up um, or long-term funding for the 988 crisis hotline. Um, as you will remember in the last legislative session, um, the legislature gave some general fund to set up the 988 line, but it did not have ongoing funding. What they did was implement a 40 cent per month per line tax on cell phones to create a long-term funding stream for 988. Now I will say, this sets up the, or it pays for the crisis line. This does not actually have enough funding in there to um, expand services for individuals who access the 988 line. So it is really just about keeping the line open and able to take phone calls. Um, and then finally, um, I will go back up to House Bill 2395, which was a bill that we worked um, with Rep Dexter on, which will expand access to, um, I gotta remember my terminology here, short acting opioid antagonists, AKA naloxone. So this allows schools, um, public buildings, um, and others to distribute naloxone um, and provide a bunch of other stuff. The other thing it does is it actually sets up a system for medical examiners to track better data on overdoses. Um, King County uh, was doing this, but this bill will also set up a system for Oregon medical examiners to better track overdoses so that public health can respond better when there is a batch of deaths due to overdoses. And then I'll hand it back to Stacy. Um, House Bill 2002, this is a bill that builds on previous legislation and it further assures access to reproductive health services in Oregon. The bill also provides protections for abortion providers and then um, the bill also expands or it requires coverage for gender affirming treatments by state medical assistance programs and health insurers. This is a big topic of conversation. Um, there were some negotiations around the bill. It, it, it evolved quite a bit from the beginning of session to the end, but those were the pieces that remained once the bill passed. And then uh, lastly, House Bill 2519, this is a bill that actually mirrors um, action that was taken by Multnomah County in 2021. And what this bill does is it prohibits, um, uh, uh, it prohibits profiting off of the public display of human remains. 
Um, there was a situation that happened here in Multnomah County and statute really lacked the ability to hold um, uh, an organization to high safety, public safety and health protocols as it relates to uh, what effectively was a public autopsy. Um, the bill creates a civil right of action for uh, individuals that might be harmed by such an event as well. So that's House Bill 2519. Um, next slide. All right, human services. So we saw some important investments both in the Oregon Department of Human Services budget as well as the newly formed Department of Early Learning and Care. This is the new DELC um, budget. Uh, this was a part of Oregon Department of Human Services and now is its own standalone agency. Um, I'll just be honest though and say that as we've seen in the past, the funding investments made in human services really fall far, far short of the need. Um, it's frequently an area that is underfunded and of course an area of incredible interest in terms of the work that we do. And we really have more to do to make sure that we're building up a robust safety net um, and supporting vulnerable individuals. You can see a couple of the items that were funded there. Um, next slide, please. So on this side, uh, House Bill 3030 and uh, Senate Bill 610, these both have to do with uh, nutrition services and food services. These are two bills that actually did not pass, but I really wanted to use this as an opportunity to highlight there was an important investment made. I believe this was through the Oregon Department of Education uh, budget. The legislature invested an additional $17 million in the Hunger Free Schools account. Um, what this will do is it will actually leverage additional federal nutrition dollars. And this investment is going to enable 76% of school sites in Oregon to participate in the community eligibility provision, um, the CEP for federal uh, child nutrition program. So this is really gonna expand those resources to schools. So again, uh, an important investment, leveraging federal dollars, but really falling pretty short of the need. We had a number of legislation that had to do with different food assistance programs. So again, I expe expect this will be an area where we'll continue to advocate. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have a number of items in the public safety uh, space. First, I'll start with Senate Bill 5504. This is the Department of Corrections budget, and we have the community corrections budget um, uh, in, in this bill. The legislature ultimately approved $246 million for community corrections statewide. Um, uh, this actually represents about a $30 million hole based on the need, and part of this reason has to do with the fact that the funding formula relies so heavily on population. Um, what we know in Multnomah County is we really need a more nuanced approach looking at how this funding uh, should be allocated. Um, we're seeing a population that just has higher need and therefore it's more expensive to care for um, this population that we manage. Um, there's renewed effort to uh, uh, go back to the legislature uh, either through an e-board ask or in the special session to be able to advocate for additional dollars in this space. Um, public defense was another um, area, obviously, of interest and a uh, hot topic coming into session. It wasn't entirely clear whether the legislature would take action. There was this very long-term conversation and long-term reforms um, that were happening. Ultimately, what we saw was we saw public defense receive an investment of $108 million to address the shortage of public defenders. The legislature also approved Senate Bill 337 to help restructure the agency and restructure how attorneys are getting paid. And then one other item I'll just note here has to do with uh, gun legislation. So coming into session, there were a number of items having to do with additional restrictions around guns. Ultimately, the only bill that passed was House Bill 2005, and this bill regulates ghost guns. Um, unfortunately, House Bill 2007 was one that we were advocating really closely. This would have allowed local governments to regulate guns on public property. This is the same ability that schools and the state has. Uh, this bill ultimately did not pass. This piece of policy did not pass. Um, next slide. All right, so just a few things here that happened with the environment and sustainability piece of the work. Um, so there was a climate package towards the end of session. It invested $90 million in climate change adaptation and also emissions reduction. Um, it's a pretty significant piece of legislation. There's a lot in there. Essentially what happened was a lot of those sort of smaller pieces of climate work that had been happening during the session got put into one big package, um, which amounted to this $90 million investment. Just a couple highlights for that package. We saw an extension of the solar rebate, 
Um, we saw a new rebate for medium and heavy duty zero emission um, trucks. We also saw um, some additional money for urban tree canopy programs. So there's a tracking mechanism and then there's also some money to actually address the gaps in tree cover. So that's really important for our work in East Multnomah County. Um, and then also I would be remiss if I didn't mention the $10 million investment in resilience hubs. I know we don't have Commissioner Segment here today, but um, she actually came to the Capitol and uh, lobbied directly on this uh, specific issue. And it's also something that um, I think we can potentially incorporate in projects going forward to make our buildings more earthquake resilient and uh, more community facing so that community members have a place to go in the event of earthquakes, but also heat and other major weather events and things like that. So, um, and that is a statewide program. We also saw uh, House Bill um, 3229 pass, which was an increase in the fee for DEQ's Title V air quality regulation program. Um, this was a really big lift. I will say that program is directly um, funded by those people that do emit much of the um, harmful particulate into the air. So as we see fewer emitters in the system, the funding for that program starts to decrease, but the work still needs to happen. So um, this session, DEQ came in asking for an 80% fee increase, which was very significant, um, and ended up coming out on the other end with a 70% fee increase. So it allows that program to remain intact with a couple of delays to hiring through the end of the current fiscal year. Um, and then I would also just note quickly that we removed a landowner requirement for um, soil water conservation districts. In Multnomah County, it's a problem because there's actually an acreage requirement for people to serve on those boards. And um, we have certain districts within Multnomah County where it's actually not possible to <laughs> own that much land because of the density of our um, more urban environment. So um, we removed that requirement and it came in late in session, but we were still successful despite the walkout, which was um, triumph. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we worked closely with Commissioner Jayapal's office trying to pass some other air quality regulations around the indirect source rule. Um, you have those two bills in front of you, 2396 and 3158. One of those bills would have essentially given DEQ more authority to regulate and the other one would have funded that work. Um, we were not successful in passing these bills this session and I think in part it's because a lot of our climate activists, uh, legislators in the region also have other major priorities like housing. And I think that this, it was hard to find enough capacity to really get this one across the finish line. So um, we're working in coalition with a bunch of other non-governmental organizations and also other local governments and state partners to try and get a little bit more direction and leadership on this for future sessions. And there's a lot of work in the interim, a lot of planning, and I think a lot of lessons learned from the work we did on these two bills this session. Next slide. Uh, transportation, so I know Justin's already mentioned Burnside Bridge, uh, 5030, House Bill 5030 is the lottery bill, lottery bond bill, and that is where we receive that funding. So just a little bit more information for that piece of it. Um, we will see likely the bonds be sold in early 2025, and so the money that we'll get, which is $20 million for the Burnside Bridge, will most likely be going to construction. Um, it's about 20% of what we'll be spending on that project in the next biennium, so I will say that Multnomah County is definitely still going to need to invest a significant amount of money in that project moving forward, but um, the fact that we have state buy-in is really important for attracting additional federal grant dollars, so we're very excited to have that i um, very grateful for the leadership of Representative Susan McLean, who is the joint chair of the Transportation Committee and was our chief sponsor for that, uh, that financial allocation. Um, and then just a couple of other highlights. Uh, House Bill 5005 was the, uh, the other bonding bill, and that is how our partners to the north, I-5 Bridge, received their funding. Um, they got a quarter of the funding they needed, $250 million, and they'll be coming back over the next three biennia to request the additional dollars they need for the match for their own federal grant process. Um, House Bill 3201 was a major um, lift. There was a lot of work that happened with utilities and other local governments, including cities, to make it so that we could leverage the $688 million coming from the federal government. Um, Oregon had a couple of statutory incongruencies with the federal requirements to be able to spend that money, and so we were able to find a path forward, uh, which is going to be a big win for Multnomah County because it will be able to be utilized not just for unserved populations, but also underserved populations, people whose internet speed is very slow relative to the need we have in today's very hybrid world. 
Um, and then the last one I'll mention, the ONA Oregon Housing Needs Analysis, House Bill 2889. This was a really comprehensive overhaul of our land use system. Um, it's definitely not a reset for the whole system, but it is a very housing forward way to look at land use policies. And there were a couple of remaining questions around this bill that is also going to have to be, that will have to be answered in the interim. So a work group is going to be starting here in August, and our um, director for land use will be serving on that work group. And we're hoping we can define a little bit more um, clearly some of the ways that this is going to play out on the local level. Next slide. Um, and then revenue, I will say this was a really tough revenue session. I think there are a lot of concerns um, at the level of the state legislature around how we raise revenue locally and how that might interface with um, the state's ability to raise revenue. So we definitely saw a few bills come forward that would have actually significantly reduced our ability to raise revenue locally. Um, one of the ones that I'll just point to um, that last bill. So we had a um, sponsor from outside of the metro region come forward with a way to limit um, essentially our funding for both preschool for all and our supportive housing services bond measure uh, income tax. And so um, it took a significant amount of work to educate legislators around how we fund these programs with local income tax dollars. Uh, we had a lot of really great public hearings and a lot of good conversations with Rev Nathanson and ultimately that bill did not pass. But I think um, in the long run, we have some work to do just I think in partnership with the legislature to figure out how to fund these services in a more sustainable way. Um, the other things that I'll mention, Senate Bill 919 is a five-year tax exemption for people who build an ADU, uh, duplex, quadplex, or triplex. And um, this is actually a, a win both for people who might develop this additional housing but also for the county so that we can incentivize people to do these kinds of developments and make them more accessible. After five years, we will come in, assess the property, and we'll, they will pay a full tax bill for that development. But for the first five years, as long as that property is not used for a vacation rental, as long as it's used as somebody's primary dwelling, um, those people who do that kind of work on their property can um, enjoy a tax exemption. Um, and then the other thing that I'll just mention really quickly, we've been working with Senator Gorsuch for quite some time to make uh, floating homes more accessible in terms of the, the reducing the barrier for tax purposes for those floating homes. A lot of them are actually naturally occurring affordable housing. Many of them are in East Multnomah County. And so we have been working on that and Senate Bill 198 was just another way that we were continuing to reduce those barriers in terms of filing requirements for people who live in those structures. Next slide. So Senate Bill 5506, this is the end of session omnibus uh, reconciliation bill. This is sometimes referred to as the Christmas tree bill due to the ornaments that are attached. Um, we've already mentioned a couple of these items. Um, one item I will uh, bring to your attention is the $20.9 million um, uh, one-time general fund allocation. Um, this is to fund food and shelter support for a very specific population of asylum seekers here in Oregon. The legislature um, included in that amount, the legislature allocated $9.8 million to Multnomah County to help stabilize that specific population in the community. This work is really limited in scope, it's limited in duration, but it's an important investment to help a real vulnerable population. Um, and then uh, we mentioned the public health modernization. This is where you find some of those additional investments that we've um, already mentioned. And then of course, $5.8 million to help fund universal representation. So I can just pause there. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a few more bills to mention. So House Bill 2004 was our ranked choice voting bill this session. Um, it extended the ability to implement ranked choice voting for multiple statewide offices. Uh, 25, uh, 2915 was a bill that we worked on with um, Representative Gomberg's office in an attempt to limit the ability for puppy mills to be profitable. Um, we had to work with Gomberg's office to make sure that we could still preserve the ability for a shelter to do pop-up adoption events with local pet stores. Um, they were very accommodating, so we were able to be successful with that. Um, we also had a couple of other bills around workforce this session. Um, you'll see Senate Bill uh, 907 at the end there. And we had a lot of concern at the beginning of session around a fatality that occurred in the agriculture industry. Um, there were a lot of people who were concerned about protecting agricultural workers in the event of uh, many of the high heat and weather events we're seeing due to climate change. And so this bill was a really, I think, um, a good balance of where we landed in terms of working with partners to find a way to both provide additional 
additional protection for workers, but also accommodate the needs that we all also have as employers. Next slide. Um, one, I, I will say one call out on that last slide is, you know, House Bill 2004, that ranked choice voting uh, legislation, we worked very closely with the county attorney's office and the speaker's office to make sure that it would not impact Multnomah County's uh, ranked choice voting that came out of the last charter review, um, nor the city of Portland's uh, ranked choice voting. So it'll allow those two ranked choice voting, it'll, it'll allow those to be perfected locally um, without being interfered um, by the state. Um, to wrap it up on the next slide, um, you know, I think, we need to do a big thank you to all the legislative coordinators um, that work in the county. So each department has assigned at least one individual in most departments, more than one individual, to work with us throughout the legislative session. Um, each of the commissioners um, have a staff member that participates in that group as well. Um, we do weekly calls with them, but they do the, a, a large amount of work for us. Um, there were over 3,000 bills, or sorry, 3,000. There were 3,000 bills um, introduced this legislative session um, the legislative coordinators helped do over 1,200 policy reviews on those bills. Um, so it's a large amount of work um, and deep policy, and it really is the foundation of how we advocate in Salem and gives us a lot of uh, policy expertise uh, when talking to legislators. So I really would just want to thank the legislative coordinators for all their work. Um, and then I think that concludes our presentation. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you giving a shout out to all the all the work that happens at the department level to help us um, help you, but all of us advocate the best we can when we go to Salem for the county things. It is that spreadsheet. If anyone has seen that spreadsheet of all the different bills, is incredibly um, large, but it's also very helpful, especially I know for me in. Um, you know, like going to AOC legislative committee meetings and just saying, hey, they're discussing this bill. What is Multnomah County's position on it? It's so I really appreciate the work and I appreciate the work all of you have done um, this session in, in such like unusual um, circumstances. And, and, and especially I do think that getting that $20 million for Burnside Bridge, I really appreciate Rep McLean's um, work on that. Um, Taylor, your, your leadership on that was incredible. And I think it helps set the stage as we look forward to a 2025 session and further discussion. But as you said, in conversations were happening at the federal level for this project. It also shows that we have skin at the game at the at the local level, we have skin at the game at the state level, and we also you know want to have that um, at the federal level as well. So appreciate all that. Um, I'm sure there will be some questions from the commissioner, so we'll go ahead and start with Commissioner Myron for that. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and thank you all of you. Uh, again, you you are truly the dream team, and we are so fortunate to have all of you um, representing us uh, in Salem. I, you do remarkable work, um, and you do remarkable work not just down here, but um, constantly um, letting all of us know on the board what's going on, keeping us up to date, um, letting us know how we can weigh in and um, just uh, generally supporting our work. So thank you, thank you. Um, I had a, just a couple of comments. I don't really have that many questions um, or comments, but just to go through, um, you know, the housing and homelessness, I don't really have any questions about that. It kind of, <laughs> it is what it is. And, uh, um, you know, I would just, my, my usual refrain of we need a, a plan so that we know where to put the money we do get in and where we can advocate for additional funds um, to be most effectively used. Uh, for health care in general, um, you know, for the Medicaid waiver, the new, you know, Senate Bill, I guess, 5525, which looks at those benefits and the cap, um, I, I have heard that things are happening very, very, very slowly and somewhat opaquely at uh, the OHA regarding how those benefits will be um, rolled out and uh, how, most importantly, how healthcare organizations, how our local government organizations can be able to be reimbursed for those funds? Is there a mechanism we anticipate that will be usable by the county 
to access some of those resources? Yeah, so, um, uh, yes. So, I, you know, there is a lot of work happening around those benefits. I, I think that it, there, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work. I think what we might see is coordination of benefits. So how do you kind of link up what's happening with the SHS funding, current county programs, and then this new benefit? Um, likely the, that money is not going to necessarily flow through the county, but how can we structure it in a system where all of those funds help the individual? So. You know, because I think that's one of the problems we're going to run into is what are the CMS requirements around those dollars? Because it's important to remember that, you know, CMS over, oversees the waiver. So they have a number of rules around what providers must do in order to receive reimbursement. Um, they have a number of requirements on what the CCO and OHA must do. You know, just as like in the healthcare environment, you have to be an enrolled provider. Um, in order to provide the benefit. Um, the individual has to be enrolled in OHP to receive the benefit. In addition, they are going to, certain subpopulations are going to be eligible for those benefits. This is not open to every OHP member. So trying to figure out how you identify those individuals who are currently in the system and how to get them access to those benefits and then how to use those other dollars, which are probably... Um, you know, the, the money that's coming from the county and the state and Metro probably have a little few, have fewer strings attached to them. Um, so I think that is partially why this is taking a little bit longer to set up. I know the state had hoped initially to set up the housing benefit by January 1st of next year. That's been pushed back to July of next year. Um, and we are hearing that they are going to focus on individuals with severe and persistent mental illness as the first population that will be eligible for those benefits. But yes, there there's a ton of work. It, it is slightly opaque. I will say um, there have been some good meetings between local providers and payers and OHA that have been happening more frequently um, recently to share some of this information and to figure out what are the the non-negotiables from CMS, like what are the rules that you have to go by um, so that providers can start preparing for that? Um, because to become a Medicaid um, enrolled provider is not easy. Um, there are auditing requirements. There are, you know, certificate requirements. There's, there's a lot of hurdles that a provider will have to overcome um, to, become, to become a provider in that world. So I think all of that is being worked out and is, you know, way above my policy expertise. I'll be honest, I think I've now just said everything I know. Um, so I, I, you know, I think there, there is more there. Um, I do want to go back to your earlier comment about um, you know, housing and homelessness for the legislature. I will say you know, we have heard the governor really clearly state that, uh, that she is hoping the next short session will focus primarily on housing production um, so that we will see kind of um, we spent a lot of time on homelessness and shelter this legislative session, but the next session, I think there's going to be a lot more talk about, you know, um, land use laws, um, SDCs, all of these things to be what can be done to help improve um, and expedite the production of housing throughout the state. So I think you know we'll be have to be we'll have to be ready for that conversation. And I'll That's stop there. super helpful. Um, really interesting. Um, and uh, I would, you know, I, I will look forward to maybe some additional engagement because, uh, you know, I'm not sure that it it makes if we if we as the county have expertise in being that Medicaid, you know, being mm -hmm. able to be that um, provider uh, that that we should be the ones that are engaging with organizations to assist them rather than putting having the organizations then be just trying to figure it out and be provide technical assistance, et cetera, and really deeply engage. I, I think everybody would agree with that statement. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, and I also, if I could read my glasses, um, I, uh, for, for behavioral health, um, it, 
similarly, you know, the, the investments that are talked about by the time they get distributed and figure out whether it's going to be a grant or not a grant and it's like sprinkled around the state, it, it's not that much. And um, the key again there is having a plan. So what little we get, you know, that we use the money we do get most effectively and can advocate for more um, with good argument. And um, for the uh, local, you know, for the burns, for all of that stuff that's happening, um, and requirements for coordination, and w is that under public health or is that under, like the requirement for coordination, I've been, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's under ORS 430, which is the behavioral health statute, um, and it narrows into the local drug and alcohol um, commission board, which is a, a board that counties are allowed to set up. Um, and so, it, you know, it basically, it, it, it's a, um, I, board is the wrong word. Um, it's a group, um, I would say. Um, and so it really, it just, we were trying to find any way to make more connection between the work that counties are doing um, and local mental health authorities are doing with the, the work that Burns are doing. I will say that you know this was a struggle when um, Burns were first set up. I do know that um, um, Anthony Jordan in uh, BHD has been working very hard to get all the Burns at a table and has actually really improved some of the relationships between Multnomah County and the Burns that are here now and has helped really I think kind of built a model that other counties can now look at of how to coordinate with your burns, uh, especially for counties that aren't receiving any ballot measure 110 funding. Um, and so there, there is some really good work happening there. Um, and I've heard from the providers that are participating that they are really vested in Multnomah County, keeping that coordination piece. This statutory language will just help reinforce that um, because there was definite resistance at the beginning of this for that coordination to happen, both from local burns and OHA. So I think we're in a better, we're moving in a better direction. We will see how that work, all this plays out in the next granting cycle, which I'm not sure when that happens. Um, but you know, all these new, all these new rules that we've tried to put in place to help make the, the process better, we will see in the next process. Okay. And then we'll come back and make more adjustments. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Um, is it? So for so is that group that Anthony is working or bringing together? Is that does that technically fall under? I mean, is it is it a thing like Lipsic is a thing that we kind of have to the local drug and alcohol group? It could be. I think that's kind of the okay. It, 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 it's it's a that's it's an informal gathering now. Got it. Now does it become a more formal gathering? Awesome. I'd, I'd love to follow up on that one on that one as well. And then, um, you know, public health modernization, you know, it's no longer modern, you know, it's, uh, but anyway, keep on going, just keep plugging away for that. Um, and one thing that I didn't see um, in your presentation on healthcare was around universal healthcare, and I know our board had passed two resolutions calling on the state to establish universal health care covering all Oregonians and then I served on that st the state task force working toward um, cr recommending a universal health care system and I believe we've taken a significant step forward and could you speak to that work at the universal health care? Well, well, I think there, there's a couple things. Um, as I remember, there is legislation that passed around universal health care and keeping the task force alive and working on that, but also steps taken by the legislature to expand access to OHP through um, you know, allowing individuals who would be eligible other than immigration status, but then also the creation of a basic health plan to bridge that gap of health care between individuals on OHP, but then end up making a little too much money mm -hmm. um, and now being on um, being able to access the, the exchange, which I think is the old word for it. Um, but so they're really trying to build that gap um, or try to build up um, so that people don't fall in that gap, so that people are able to transition back and forth. That's in process. I, 
you know, I will say OHA got money this legislative session to build out kind of a short-term fix for people who, because they're going through redetermination now on OHP. Um, so for folks that fall in that crack right now, there is funding available to keep them on um, a, a bridge plan, as they're calling it, to make sure that they don't lose coverage. So w instead of going universal health care for all, they, the legislature has kind of picked populations to increase coverage for. And I, and I will say they, they have continued to do that every legislative session that I've been around is they kind of pick up a new group every time. Um, so we're seeing progress made um, and then continuing that task force um, of the universal health care to just kind of keep that work going generally is, happen, mm -hmm. is happening. So for the task force, I mean, it's a different task force mm -hmm. and it's a governance board. Like, mm -hmm. is it, what is the structure that's set up to continue I will have to go back and check. Okay. I don't remember. Okay, that's that's, yeah. that's fine. And then I just had one one last um, uh, question that was around. I think I had one last question. Oh, for um, there was mention that nine percent per child increase for preschool promise within um, human services, and I'm just curious how that would intersect with the county's um, work and preschool for all and. Again, I guess it's some of that intersectional work around all the different universal preschool kind of work that's happening. Yeah, I can go back and look at the details and follow up with you. I know that folks were really thoughtful about ensuring that whatever benefits we built on at the state level helped build on what we were doing here at the local level, and we were in, able to engage a little bit. And I know there were some conversations about just recognizing increased cost. Um, so I'm not sure how much actually equates um, uh, to uh, an, an expanded benefit, more so just covering some of those increased costs. But I'll go back and look at the okay. details and I can follow up with awesome. you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, and I will just add, I know that um, one of the challenges were that providers were not um, wanting to become preschool promise providers because the, um, the reimbursement rates and those funds were not adequate to cover the cost. So there was actually, we were seeing a decrease in some preschool promise slots, uptake on preschool promise slots throughout the state because of that. So that 9% really does make a difference from that piece of it, for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Bram Edwards. Thank you. Um, since I wasn't here when the legislative agenda got set, it's um, looking back um, or at this vantage point, it's, uh, a fairly comprehensive, huge lift, and um, I do know that the dynamics of this session made that um, even more complicated. Um, I had a couple questions, um, some just technical or more administrative, and then at some other just overarching um, questions. Um, the community corrections um, budget, which is on uh, slide 14, yesterday um, at the Lipsic meeting, you outlined more of the impacts of the $30 million impact, and I was wondering if you could sh share that, and then um, I noted you said this morning and also yesterday that that would be um, something that would be there for the special session or um, the next session, so I'm curious um, what we do in the meantime and um, just the impact that's gonna have on the um, our public safety here in this community. Sure, um, so uh, um, I, I think how about Stacy? can talk about the impacts. Uh, I'll talk kind of some of the politics around that, and then I think the chair can talk about the, the impact and what the plan is locally. Because the funding was formula funding, I'll say that the $246 million in that shortfall, it, it wasn't necessarily surprised. We knew that that was likely the, the way that the legislature was able to go. So it did give us an opportunity to really dig in and understand what the impact would be. Um, and as part of the advocacy, we pulled together a lot of details. And of course, we had the sheriff come down and the chair come down and tried to do really robust um, lobbying around the effort. So I'm happy to outline um, some of the impacts that, that we had identified with that $30 million statewide whole. So um, on the DC, DCJ side of things, we would be um, looking at the possibility of eliminating 23 positions. Um, and of course, that would result in a reduction of housing and treatment services. On the, uh, on the sheriff side of things, the Multnomah County Sheriff Office um, is stands to lose 19 FTE and close three dorms. This is the equivalent of 215 beds. Um, we know, of course, that the outcomes do result in individuals receiving less supervision, and then there is the possibility of an emergency release uh, situation at the Multnomah County Jail. 
And I'll say that, you know, we, we were feeling optimistic. We had good conversations. It felt like the legislature understood that the funding wasn't meeting the need, but there was this tension that exists with the traditional way of funding based solely on these forecasts. So, you know, we were trying to make the argument that there was this immediate need now. We thought was built, the forecast was built on what is likely at least partially a temporary reduction in some of those populations. Um, and then, of course, we've been calling for a more nuanced approach that looks at the cost of actually delivering the services because it's important to maybe relook at that. Does that answer the question? Sorry. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess just a, a, yeah. Actually, one piece. So those out um, the reductions that were outlined, which um, are pretty concerning, just given. Um, the pretty thin nature and also the, the relatively um, high level currently of crime and gun violence in our community. Um, so are those rolling through or is this more of a question for the budget team of whether those actually reductions are being made? Yeah, so I, I think the chair is probably the best person to answer that question. Yeah, so we, so in our budget um, that we passed in, in June, um, we had set aside contingency dollars um, specifically for the 1145 um, potential shortfall. And so we do have dollars set aside for this. I will say back in, um, I think it was like 2017 or 2018, we had, a sim we had to go through a similar practice when the 1145 dollars cr were creating a similar shortfall for um, DCJ and our sheriff's department where the, those departments went through and had to say what reductions they were going to take. Um, we do have, like I said, the contingency dollars set aside. We will be taking board action to move those dollars into the budget to use for some of that. There are still gonna have to be decisions made in terms of what we're able to fund, um, you know, based on based on the shortfall. But we have, and um, maybe Christian can come forward. I don't remember the exact amount that we had set aside in contingency for that. Maybe I could mention also too, as part of the budget discussions, I know there was some discussion on ways and means that they would reevaluate the impacts during the short session. Um, legislative leaders said, let's, let's come back, let's reevaluate it, let's see if some of the forecasts held or if in fact there's additional dollars. So it at least seemed that there would be interest in revisiting the conversation. And I'll also just say that we've had internal conversations about going and potentially asking the legislature if there's an opportunity for an e-board, which would happen before the end of the year. So, so I think all of these things are on the table as possible solutions. Actually, Christian, go first. Uh, thank you, Chair, Commissioners, Christian Elkin, Budget Director, I use she, her pronouns. So yeah, just confirming what the, the Chair has laid out. And, and then this has been kind of a historical issue for the county. I've been here 20 years. We, I probably had this conversation no less than five or six times with the board because it is, it's so impactful and the 1145 is such a, uh, an important partnership with the state. So I appreciate that we're continuing to have that conversation. We set aside just under $6 million of one-time only funding, anticipating that we knew that the governor's starting point was lower than we needed it to be. We also knew that we had just negotiated contracts with our labor unions and public safety that were gonna increase our costs. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing pushing from both sides on that funding source. And so we knew that this was gonna need to be. And then when the session uh, was being held up, we also knew that we didn't have a lot of time to, to have those robust conversations. So um, we're excited to see those continue. Uh, I would like to remind the board that those are one-time only funds. Um, we are scheduled to come back and have a, a bigger discussion about how that funding is braided with county general funds and how it funds our services and public safety. Um, and we'll need to continue to uh, figure out ways to in improve uh, the state's understanding of what it costs for us to run those services. And we're gonna be taking up, um, it's gonna be coming for the board for a briefing, but we'll go into much more detail about this on August 22nd, and then we will take the board action around um, moving contingency dollars on August 28th, or August 24th. Okay, just, so just a follow-up question, um, so I'm glad to hear that timeline, but in the meantime, is the six, is the six million going to be enough to avoid um, what I think, I think people would be shocked if we were, it's like moving in the opposite direction, so would this, the, so in the meantime, but between now and when we actually um, take action, or even when we take action, is that are those funds going to be enough, at least temporarily, to um, eliminate those um, pretty severe impacts on 
on the system or? Those are the estimates that we received from the departments as we were preparing this. So um, it roughly represents about three dorms in the sheriff's office and about 19 FTE and DCJ. So that will allow them to kind of have that gap funding until a solution is figured out. So it gets us to the e-board or the next legislative session? Yeah, so I, so I think the, the thing to add to this is, you know, this is a statewide problem. Um, this is not just a Multnomah County problem. Um, we're seeing similar cuts in Lane County, Washington County, uh, and other counties. So we are currently working with our county counterparts um, to develop a plan to go back to the legislature and ask this. And I will say, as Christian said, this is a continual problem that we have um, because the way the $1145 are distributed is every six years they're supposed to true up, but they never do. Um, so we constantly run into this problem and then they basically say, you know, the number of people you supervise on average per day times $12 and that is the funding you get. So there's not that flexibility when something like ballot measure 110 happens and we lose people we are supervising. So, you know, and I'm sure we will go, we will do a rehistory of 1145 at some point um, and bring back all of the old documents to explain how we got to this place. But it is, um, it is a uh, antiquated funding formula, um, but the legislature loves the funding formula, as you know. Um, thank you. Appreciate that. Just given the magnitude yesterday when I heard that it was um, pretty concerning considering where we are as a community in terms of public safety right now. Um, in terms of the stands public safety here, uh, the public defenders, uh, there was a major effort I know by um, a lot of different um, entities and individuals and leaders to um, increase the funding for public, the, the broken funding mechanism for public defenders and made some pretty significant progress. Um, although there was a disproportionate um, impact of the lack of public defenders on counties across the state, so Multnomah and Washington and a few others um, in particular had a much uh, more severe, severe shortage. Was the, money, the, the level of money that was allocated, will that address what we anticipated Multnomah County um, needed? Um, so that's a great question. I can go in and dig in and find out exactly how much is coming to the region. What I do know is that there there is an ongoing longer term conversation and actually coming into session, there was discussion of potentially not necessarily providing additional funding now, but maybe waiting till next biennium. And I think they realized that they needed to do something now. So I expect this to be sort of, uh, this isn't even phase one, maybe phase two of several phases. Um, what we do know is that as part of Senate Bill 33, so they funded this sort of restructuring. They have 108 million to add public defenders. This is on top of 100 million that they allocated in the last session as part of a special purpose appropriation. Um, part of Senate Bill 337, I mentioned this yesterday in the LIPSIC, but um, a couple of the things that they're gonna do is it directs the commission to do a survey and an economic analysis to establish a formula for hourly pay. Um, and uh, uh, so that'll help get at some of the pay concerns. Um, it creates a minimum target that 20% of all appointed counsel at the trial level must be employed by the commission. So part of the discussion had been whether you would be contracting out this work or work as part of the commission. And then the last piece that I'll just mention that I think help gets to understanding the need and the flexibility of different needs at different times around the state. They're gonna direct the commission to establish and maintain a panel of qualified uh, counsel that can be directly assigned to cases. So it's almost a, a, an additional pool. Um, so what I'll say is I, I don't think this uh, gets at everything and especially to your piece around the funding i do think it helps shore up the immediate crisis and there are some important pieces that'll be in place that i think we're, we're hopeful we'll we'll start to see some improvement but there's a lot of continued work that needs to be done here and i anticipate that they'll come back and continue to make tweaks and changes and build on these reforms and, and you can uh, tell me whether i should direct this uh, question to the district attorney's office um, but i also know in multnomah county um, because of COVID that um, there were many cases that um, are still sitting out there and that um, one of the issues is that all those cases also there's would be a need for public defenders. 
and a concern that had been raised in the community um, was that uh, because there was such a big backlog and because of the, uh, la the lack of public defenders, especially in Multnomah County, that a lot of those cases would ultimately just get dismissed because of the time. And so I'm curious whether that was taken in the, the backlog, not just the day-to-day -day, um, that we currently have the need for public defenders, but whether the backlog um, is, there was funding to address public defenders for those, those backlog of cases. Um, that's definitely probably a good question for the DA's office. I will say that I know that I know that the conversation, the big statewide conversation, recognized that there was tremendous backlog and that the, that there were individuals that were in need of uh, representation today, uh, a large number of folks. So I, I know there was a recognition generally. I think some of the specifics for Multnomah County, I bet the DA's office can provide some good data there. And then just my, my last question, which was is more of a, um, relating to the housing um, and homelessness services and shelter, the, the funding, this is more uh, a technical question, but it looked on, on slide eight, you had um, the, sort of laid out all the, the, the package, the yeah. 200 million, and um, it divides it out into various, um, segments of funding and the very first um, segment from the 200 million is 85 million and it says that 18 of that is going to Multnomah County, Portland and Gresham. But then the rest of the segments relating to prepaid rent assistance, rent assistance, services to homeless youth, those are all appear to be statewide numbers. Do we know yet what the Multnomah County allocation or what the funding may flow through the amount is? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm still working to get some of those details. I think we can, we roughly assume we get just shy of 20%, but I can follow up with specifics. Is that because that's the per capita? Yeah, so I, so I think that there's, that, that bill kind of funded things in two ways. One was the direct allocation to local governments in the 85 million. So that was the easy one. Um, the other ones are all done via a formula, um, which I will say is a more complicated formula than the 1145 um, <laughs> formula because it, it it, it factors in level of poverty, average rent. It, fa it factors in about 30 different things to figure out what each community gets. Um, then there also is a conversation between OHCS and, and the local um, housing authority, not housing authorities, but um, uh, forgetting the acronym, but um, counties and others on, on how those dollars are distributed. So the community action agencies. So there's just, there's a lot more process that happens in those dollars. Great, and then just my last question is around ballot measure 110. Um, so a lot of conversation about um, the money not getting out, out the door and um, therefore individuals not getting the treatment that most voters thought they were gonna get. And as you were describing the changes in the, in the bill, they sounded like clarifications or better defining. Um, did they add a set of metrics that um, will actually be able to, it's, a, it's a large amount of money um, that's being allocated for treatment. Did they um, put in metrics in terms of um, for the, the grants that are going out, um, the expectations of treatment provided? No, so they, um, they did increase the audits from the Secretary of State on those outcomes, but they did not set um, those types of goals in the statute. I will say, you know, one of the things that is that is lined out in the Ballot Measure 110 is, um, you know, it is payer of last resort. Um, so for services that are already covered by Medicaid, Medicare, or individual insurance, um, the Ballot Measure 110 funds do not pay for those types of services. So a lot of the services they pay for are, you know, uh, SUD housing, uh, which is not covered in there, and the other kind of ancillary services are around kind of that direct um, treatment that happens. So there, there's there's a little bit of play in which money is used to pay for what. Um, and I, I think that's one of the reasons they don't have exact outcomes on treatment. But um, I will say the reporting that is required by the Bout Measure 110 uh, Oversight Committee has increased so that we will be able to see, you know, what metrics they are reaching and, and what services they are providing. I just, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. Did you say that the, um, I think I heard you say that it's like the, the, 
the payer of payer of last resort. resort. Yeah. But then you also said they weren't paying for treatment directly. So yeah, so if the treatment that doesn't is covered, sound like what so, I think yeah, so I think it's lot. kind of how you define which service is treatment and which isn't. So if you know if it's a medical provider coming in providing SUD treatment, that is usually covered by Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, or other. And so the ballot measure one ten dollars don't pay for that. They oftentimes then pay for peer services to help get somebody into treatment, um, housing that's associated with treatment, or services to help make sure that an individual can stay with the treatment they are getting from the medical provider. So you know if you're seeing a licensed clinician. The ballot measure won ten dollars. Don't pay for that, um, and they have created a bright line in that in that process. So I'm going to suggest that you have a further conversation about ballot measure one ten, and potentially we have it like on the whole, especially with some of this new legislation specifically. Mm -hmm. We have the library to still to go, Sorry. so we're about ten minutes right. over, um, and I know they have a very long slide presentation that they want to get through, and, and we have a hard stop today at noon, um, so we can figure. it yeah. That'd be great, and I have very few questions about the library presentation, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right. But I do, th I think that would be beneficial because I, um, I do think most people when they voted for ballot measure 110 thought that it was the dollars were paying for treatment. Um, so it would be useful to better understand that um, because that seems to be the missing link. Yeah, and, and I think we can help facilitate a conversation between both the advocates for ballot measure 110 and other folks to come in and get different perspectives on it as well. Wonderful. All right, that sounds great. Thank you so much, all of you, for all of your work in this presentation. And um, we'll look forward to having that fuller 20-page report that you talked about. Um, well, we, we'll all keep our eye out for that. So thank you all very much. Um, with that, we'll move on to our second board briefing for today, which is from our <laughs> Um, informational board briefing on the library capital bond program. This is our um, regularly regularly scheduled quarterly report that we get on how um, all of our bond projects are going, and we're very glad to have um, Bailey Old Elke. 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 I know. I was just like, I looked at the O, and it just threw me <laughs> off. It throws everybody off for seven years. Uh, Bailey Elke, and the, and so many folks from the library um, bond committee here. So um, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson, Commissioners, Bailey Elke, Director of Libraries, uh, she, her pronouns. I was thinking maybe I'd just sit down and say, it's all going fine. <laughs> but um, we do have uh, a number of uh, slides, but I assure you we are not intending to belabor each one. Um, so we are going to be brief. I will say, uh, next slide please that we are, as we have done in the past with these briefings, we're going to sort of spotlight a few topics, and today we're gonna to particularly spotlight um, new technology and creative spaces. And we'll be spending less time talking about individual projects because there's a lot going on, but of course, as always, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I'm also going to allow my colleagues here to introduce themselves as they speak. Next slide, please. Uh, we, as always, will be providing a land acknowledgement. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands are now called Multnomah County. Quote, the Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. And, end quote, and that's from the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable of 2018. We acknowledge the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Next slide, please. Just quickly, you're familiar with our uh, pillars and our priorities. Uh, just a reminder that we're in the process of a new strategic plan that should be um, uh, released in the not too distant future. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Day. Thank you, Bailey, and good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Mike Day. I'm the Library Bond Program Director, and we're excited to uh, provide you with an update and an overview today. Starting with, next slide. Slide that uh, we're all familiar with, and this really reflects the overall portfolio of all of the various projects that are currently underway 
Uh, as you can see, we are now in uh, July of 2023, uh, well into two years into the process uh, with the Operations Center being our first project that we'll be wrapping up this fall. Uh, overall, the projects are uh, going well. They're on the overall schedule and the timeline that we anticipate. And the wind down we anticipate of all the projects uh, really occurring towards the end of 2025. Kate Vance later in our presentation will dive into more details on specific projects and again this just gives you that overall view of the portfolio of the sequencing timeline. Next slide please. So let's talk about the kind of overall big picture on the, the financials and the library bond uh, budget summary. Our total uh, bond budget uh, is $443.2 million, which includes uh, the general obligation bonds, of course, the bond premium reserve, also interest uh, income earnings, and other funding from outside sources, uh, specifically from the library district. Uh, the overall contingencies, as you can see here, and as you add those numbers up, for contingencies that are not committed or earmarked specifically uh, are tracking very nicely at 49.7 million. This really equates to approximately 15% of the unspent uh, portion of the project budget that we have not uh, incurred costs on yet. Next slide, please. This gives you a kind of a breakdown and a summary uh, that we've shared with you uh, uh, that breaks it down into the buckets of the different projects. The, the changes from last quarter are reflected here, which include um, the implementation of the uh, Intelligent Materials Management System, the IMMS project, which Jacob will share more about with you later this morning. Uh, some enhancements in terms of life cycle costs to the mechanical system for the East County Library. Uh, GMP adjustments for our final GMPs on Albina and North Portland, and some adjustments to the seismic requirements uh, for the St. John's Library. Next slide, please. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, of course, is a key uh, anchor to all of our projects in the portfolio of the bond program. Uh, also just embracing holistically um, community-informed design with our community engagement process, uh, as well as how we engage with our COVID partners. COVID is the state agency uh, here in Oregon that's the certification office for business inclusion and diversity. And so that is the, the state uh, agency that all uh, minority women, emerging small businesses and uh, uh, service disabled veterans work with uh, for certification in the state of Oregon. We're gonna go through uh, some, some updates specifically on projects and wanna share those with you and highlight some of the great examples of our uh, stories and the successes that we've had to date. Starting with our next slide, professional services. This graphic really breaks down um, uh, the certified uh, COVID professional services, but also we have other firms from outside of the state of Oregon that are certified in other states. So when you look at that whole pie, it's approximately 55% uh, or $14.6 million of our major uh, architectural and engineering consulting firms that are supporting and serving the library bond program. Next slide now, we'll get into some specifics on projects with our contractor partners. Using the CMGC construction manager general contractor methodology really has allowed us to leverage early involvement uh, with our contractor partners to engage with uh, COVID firms. As you can see with the operations center, we continue to track well uh, above the uh, aspirational kind of baseline target of 25% at 35.5%. Moving on to Holgate now, next slide. Uh, with Holgate, we are tracking above the 25%, the right at 26%, and uh, that project's going well, uh, and that, con that project is well into construction, so we'll have more on that as Kate provides a project update. With Midland, the next slide, 
Uh, we're slightly under our aspirational target of 25% and working very close with Swinerton, our CMGC, on looking for ways to uh, improve and increase those numbers to a minimum hit our 25% target. Next slide. Moving on now to North Portland, uh, we've had uh, very impressive results with the outreach process uh, reaching into the COVID community uh, and hitting a 51% uh, mark, uh, which is pretty remarkable uh, for a project of this size. Next slide, Albina is tracking at 28% uh, and just getting into the construction phase. Uh, if you drive by the Albina site, you'll find the uh, existing ISOM building is currently being uh, demolished and removed in preparation for the new construction. Moving on to the next slide, now we're going to look at the Central uh, Library Refresh Project. Uh, which is, again, a great example of partnership uh, with COVID firms uh, hitting the 51% mark. And last slide on DEI. Next slide, thank you. Uh, these are projects that are currently in various stages of planning uh, and design, uh, starting with the East County Library. Uh, Fortis Construction is our CMGC partner. Uh, and uh, again, we're very early in the process, uh, moving into the construction document phase, bringing on a selected group of trade partners that will be engaging uh, in the COVID process uh, in the coming months and really through the, the remainder of this year, we'll have more updates uh, and, and metrics for you for the East County Library. One of the things I would add, uh, and it's certainly noted for both uh, East County Library as well as the refresh projects, that there has been a strong commitment to uh, partnering with uh, COVID firms. Uh, in, in the case of East County Library, we've got three uh, COVID subprime firms that are really taking on, uh, in, a, in a sense, a, a sub-CMGC capacity and not just acting as subcontractors, but there's a mentoring and a coaching aspect uh, to that project that uh, really, really is forward thinking uh, and lifting up and supporting uh, the COVID firms to at some point in the future be able to take on uh, larger scopes of work uh, as primes as well. Just getting started now on our chapter three projects, Northwest St. John's and Belmont, uh, and we're in the early stages of programming, so we'll have more to share in the coming months as we just uh, engage in the uh, programming efforts, the community engagement, uh, so more to come on that. And lastly, again, with the refresh projects, uh, with Swinerton as our partner, we've had a, just a strong commitment uh, and formed uh, with the equity participation plan uh, an approach and a strategy that involves um, three uh, subprime uh, contractors working under Swinerton on the smaller refresh projects in a GC capacity. With that, I am going to hand off to Liz now, and she's going to update us on some highlights with the community, uh, communications, and community engagement. Thank you so much, Mike, and uh, good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Liz Sauer. Uh, I'm the Communications Manager for these library building projects, uh, she, they pronouns. Um, I'm here in uh, Katie O'Dell's stead, so I hope to do her proud. Um, and so. <laughs> Uh, just briefly, um, although I'm the communications manager, I work really to amplify a lot of our community engagement work. Um, and so just a reminder that all of this work is guided by our community engagement ethos, um, which are translated into our service languages and up on our website, um, and just really working to hold a high level of accountability to the community at all times, um, ensuring that we are being accessible in all of our work, uh, uh, as well as equitable and just. Uh, and there are really specific uh, definitions of what that means exactly, um, so uh, the community can find them. And really, it's a good reminder to us in our work every day as well. Um, I work hand in hand with uh, Suzanne Cho, my colleague, who's the uh, community engagement coordinator for these projects. Um, and really, as Mike mentioned, just robust outreach efforts that we're engaging in. Um, everything from paid outreach opportunities like uh, community design advocates, which we will be uh, using.
using again uh, for Belmont Library. Um, so community members who have great engagement already in their communities, um, helping to ensure that uh, the design concepts and ideas and visions of community members from uh, elderly communities, people experiencing houselessness, as well as black and indigenous communities um, have their ideas at the forefront of this work. Um, and so just a brief uh, reminder of kind of this work that uh, also carries over into communication. So um, just getting to what honestly keeps being uh, quite few busy months uh, in terms of our announcements and media coverage. Uh, most recently, we had the East County Library groundbreaking uh, in collaboration with TriMet and Gresham, uh, as well as our Community Library Champions, which is another great program working with the Black Economic Collective, as well as El Programa Hispano. Um, and so just an excellent end to what's been a series of really successful groundbreakings in the past few months. Uh, and so also uh, just a reminder sent out uh, for our community members and media about Gregory Heights construction that uh, started um, or will be starting soon uh, and Gregory Heights was closed to the public as of July 20th. Um, another great collaboration uh, between uh, the library and the Regional Arts and Culture Council, a uh, recent announcement uh, that looked uh, at all of the artists and artwork for Operation Center, Holgate, and Midland. Um, so really just an extensive announcement that was picked up by the Oregonian, and you can see uh, kind of a celebration that we uh, did on social media as well uh, together. And just looking at uh, just the diverse artists and their incredible perspectives and the artwork that they're going to be bringing um, with community engagement as well. Uh, so tying that in uh, so that the community has a way to get involved in the artwork too. Uh, next slide. Uh, just continuing with the communications highlights. Uh, one of the tools that we're using is an asynchronous survey, um, meaning that for the East County Library, we really wanted to hear kind of the themes that people had in mind for what kind of art they wanted to see in this incredibly uh, dynamic new library. Uh, we had uh, really great responses in all of our service languages, which are Chinese, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese, um, and just really working on more expansive outreach efforts. So we uh, took out a print and digital ad campaign in the Gresham Outlook to provide more of a, a focused effort, um, but this was really open to everyone because we really imagine that this is going to be um, an incredible regional library, but also something that people can travel to and enjoy it as well. Um, and so as Mike mentioned, uh, getting underway for the next phase of uh, projects, um, that includes Belmont and Northwest for our community engagement efforts. Uh, we'll be having a couple of open houses at both locations um, coming up. And uh, so we've got translated flyers in all of the service languages um, and really focusing on uh, what those demographics are for those specific locations. So now on to uh, community engagement. Um, and so as I mentioned, just a lot of work that uh, communications and community engagement does together. Um, for East County Library right now, uh, we're really focused uh, with the design team on getting input around interior details, um, as well as keeping communities informed uh, since uh, the design work, or a lot of the design input uh, continues. Um, we hosted a recent community open house that was incredibly successful. Folks, uh, you know, it's already a busy time uh, at Gresham Library, um, but we just had a number of people who came specifically because they wanted to hear about the updates, they wanted to meet the design team and uh, see the renderings and provide feedback around the interior details. Um, we're also reaching out to community events in Wood Village and Gresham, um, and so working on uh, building community relationships there too. 
Uh, in regards to phase three for Northwest, Belmont, and St. John's, um, as I mentioned, uh, we're kicking off, um, and actually the uh, open house for Belmont will be on August 3rd, uh, so not this Thursday, but the following uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, there will also be a Northwest open house on July 30th at Northwest Library, um, and just really building out our community engagement strategies for these locations, um, since really every project has a really uh, bespoke approach, uh, that's focused on what is right for the diverse communities in those locations. And with that, I will turn it over to Jacob. Great, thanks Liz. Good morning Chair, good morning, good morning Commissioners. My name is Jacob Farkas and I am the Library Capital Bond IT Program Manager. And uh, we're gonna spotlight some of the technology and creative spaces that are gonna be uh, moving into these uh, libraries of the future. Um, next slide, please. So to, to start out, we're gonna talk about automated materials handling, or AMH, as we um, often call it. So an AMH system is really a, a conveyance um, system for library ma uh, materials and items, uh, so they get sorted and checked in appropriately. Um, what we have the ability to do is to configure those for our unique needs of the library. So depending on um, how a library wants to sort their materials or how the operation center wants to sort their materials, we have the ability to um, configure those sort tables is what they're called and then uh, run that through. Um, so with each different um, implementation, those can be different. And with each different system, you can have more than one sort. Uh, so it can be really efficient um, and used in several different ways. Uh, of course, this type of a system integrates well with um, our existing technologies. So we have an integrated library system called Symphony, which is really the main database of information for the library. Uh, so it has um, patron information and holds and what's been borrowed. Uh, and so the sorters integrate with that seamlessly to know if a, a material is coming through that is on hold for somebody, it sets it in the right place uh, so that it can be picked up. And then Mike mentioned uh, a little bit earlier the implementation of um, IMS or Intelligent Material Management System. So this is a software layer that will work um, in sync with AMH and does a really great job of um, controlling the collection and where it goes. Uh, and of course, it is also uh, configured by uh, the library um, and we can determine um, where materials should go, and it can get really, really uh, down to the nitty gritty, down to even a shelf level of how much um, of that shelf you want filled up with books. Um, it can also um, be intelligent, as it's noted there, and recognize that a number of, let's say, Stephen King books are being checked out at a specific library. It will ship more Stephen King books to that library, recognizing that that's trending in some, in some fashion. Um, and then also um, the AMH uh, provides some ergonomic benefit and um, efficiencies. Um, what we'll find for our staff is they're doing less bending um, and moving of materials. And um, with, uh, with the AMH uh, comes something called tote check-in system where um, a complete crate of books can be checked in um, all together, so a total of 40 or 50 books, rather than an individual needing to check each one in individually and bring that across, a whole set of books can be checked in. Um, and that's already in place right now, so we're getting some really good um, uh, efficiencies out of that already. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a video. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. It's not going to play the video? Oh, okay. Congrats. Yeah. You'll this, just have to come see it. That's right. Please email it to us afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. It was going to be better than the Barbie movie. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll move on. Okay. Public computing, of course, is a huge need at the library. Um, we, we gathered some great analysis and feedback, of course, showing that um, you know, printing, scanning, copying are always in high demand. Um, and uh, what we also know, though, are that you know, device needs are evolving. We still have um, individuals who want to sit down at a complete workstation and lay out their stuff and get to work. Uh, we also have folks who want to use an iPad or um, what you see here uh, in the image is the uh, laptop checkout system that we have available at Central Library. So this is uh, giving folks an, an opportunity to just check out a laptop to use. 
So people just have different needs and they might even just bring their own device and all they need is Wi-Fi and a place to plug in. Uh, so we're really making sure that we're addressing all of these and, uh, and ensuring patrons are getting what they need from a computing perspective. Um, and then, um, of course, just a spot to charge a device, whether that's a phone or a tablet, uh, making sure we've got outlets and things available. And uh, we've talked um, a lot about uh, broadband at each of the different libraries. So we are installing um, faster and um, more bandwidth um, at each library location. And uh, we'll be hanging external Wi-Fi access points at each library branch as well to extend the range of Wi-Fi. Next slide, please. Okay, we focus a lot on audiovisual solutions as well. Um, of course, the pandemic uh, changed the way that we connect with one another, right? So whether that's a staff or a patron, um, we want to ensure that we have easy access to AV equipment. Um, there's a reference here to uh, this Washington Post article to, that talked about libraries evolving to serve remote workers. Um, and, and, uh, and it had a lot of really great points um, of the um, accessibility within a library for the free Wi-Fi, for the printing, copying, scanning. You know, it's already um, very attractive to somebody who's um, working remotely. Um, but now what we'll see um, at our libraries are these really state-of-the-art um, conferencing abilities with cameras and microphones um, and um, audio and video available to folks to use really, really easily. That was our um, number one goal is that it's easy to use. Um, and so we're really focusing on that. Um, that article also uh, talked about you know, this journey that some individuals might be having from a professional perspective of you know, coming to the library first to fill out you know, an unemployment form you know, online and getting some help with that, and then coming back to the library for um, help with a resume and applying for a job, and then coming back to the library to do a virtual interview and those are all the things that we want to make available for our patrons here, um, and, and, and that will be possible for them. Um, the other thing that we are focusing on with um, our AV solutions is making them standard and consistent. So what you see at one library is um, you know, what you'll see at another one, uh, what we focused on with our phase one projects for sure. Uh, and that really helps with um, usability by staff and patrons, but then also maintaining those systems. Uh, and then we've um, talked a lot about some of these other kind of specialty spaces, um, the recording studio, the auditorium, the teen space, the maker space, all of these really fantastic um, areas for patrons to get really involved and do some really neat things with technology. Next slide, please. So in our self-service area, we've been focusing a lot on um, the uh, self-checkout stations. Um, so we uh, have existing self-checkouts. Um, they're just kind of big and bulky and take up quite a bit of space. Uh, so what we're able to do is um, get some new and upgraded technology here. And this is a look at the uh, types of self-checkouts that we're focusing on. So a standalone kiosk and then also um, a countertop kiosk. Um, patrons have expressed interest in doing self-service. It provides some privacy uh, for those who just want to check something out um, on their own. Um, it's intuitive. There are big buttons and there are language options um, for the patron to choose from. Um, for those folks who maybe don't want contact, um, again, some of the um, um, changes from the pandemic. Uh, and then it can be fun. I know my kids love a self-checkout station and you know, adults do too. Um, it, of course, it, you know, I know integrates with our um, library system as well. Um, and then it also um, provides a really great space to promote, um, whether it's an event or a program for the library on those big screens there when they're not being used for self-checkout. Next slide, please. Our technology team focuses a lot on the technology infrastructure. So this is really anything that we talk about behind the walls of the buildings. Um, so this uh, little diagram up here just gives you an idea of the very detailed information that gets put together to, this is to hang a TV and um, shows that it's gotta be at five feet, six inches and um, you know, the, uh, um, 
the top can only be at a certain level, and this is all very detailed and, and um, all uh, for very specific reasons. You know, you look around this room and you see these floor plates on the floor or the outlet over there or the wall up there, and um, I've, I've certainly learned a lot over the last couple of years of um, all of the work that goes into that and the discussion and thought, um, and our team gets to be involved in a lot of those discussions and decisions, and it's really fantastic. And then we help with the moves as well. So the, as the libraries are opening and closing, um, the IT team uh, helps to coordinate and track all of that uh, equipment. And then if there's an opportunity to repurpose it, like at the central pop-up, you know, helps to get that all set up so it's up and running for uh, patrons to use. Okay. And I just want to do a time check because we've got about 20 more minutes. And I, I know we're anxious to hear about the projects and how they're going for the specific libraries as well, although this is all very interesting, so thank you. That's great. Last slide. Um, should only take about 20 minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> then that would be the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> So we do, um, as you saw early on, the, the library has a, um, a pillar um, you know, around equity and we want our um, technology projects to do the same. We have tried to start our technology projects with a really equity-driven approach um, using resources uh, that exist and then also um, building some things along the way. So just to stay in line with the library's pillars, um, we've tried to ad uh, adopt that with our technology projects as well. And now, it's going over to Bailey That's for right. Creative Learning Spaces. Thank you, Jacob. And just quickly, next slide, please. You've heard us talk a lot about the new opportunities we'll be able to provide the community with these larger spaces, more flexible spaces. There's a big focus on STEAM spaces um, that allow both youth and adults access to technology that they may not otherwise have access to. We're super excited about that and happy to talk more about that um, in, a, in a future briefing. Okay. Thank you, Bailey. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Kate Vance. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Deputy Director for the Bond, one of the de two Deputy Directors for the Bond Program. Um, our intent is to briefly touch on each of these major projects, um, and we will focus on significant actions or changes, and we're happy to answer any questions, but in the interest of time, we'll go through them briefly. Next slide, please. Um, this is a way to help commissioners and other stakeholders and interested parties understand which phase each of the bond projects is in. Next slide, please. And we'll start with the operations center. Next slide. Located at 122nd and Gleason, the new operations center provides critical back of house activities to keep the library functioning. New materials are received and dispersed, outreach services and the main AMH unit that Jacob talked about will reside here. The library is not reducing the library's collection sizes, but this allows the library to more efficiently get materials to patrons faster and frees up space at the local branches for materials cultivated for that specific service area. Also um, of note is that we are tracking toward the building being a net zero energy building with all of our uh, uh, solar panels that are there. Work on the building continues to progress well, and the architects are meeting with artists selected by library staff for the interior graphics. Next slide, please. Just a couple of little update photos. Uh, these images show the in-progress skin installation and the grid of the solar panel uh, that the solar panels will rest on is visible in the left-hand slide. Next slide, please. Here you can see us starting to install the mechanical system up in the ceilings. Next slide, please. There are no changes to the schedule. Uh, we're happy to report that the building power was able to go on about a week earlier than expected. And we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on this project with substantial completion this fall. Next slide, please. Uh, we originally, when we first developed this budget, had $150,000 for the M system. We've decided to pull that out of this uh, budget and consolidate that with the entire rest of the M's project that was established. Um, and then we will, we do have some surplus contingency and we will be moving um, about two and a half million dollars from that over to the East County Library project. Next slide, please. We're turning to Holgate with our exciting new rendering. Um, as a reminder, this branch will be three times the size of the previous building. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 
You're good. <laughs> we broke ground this past winter and we've completed demolition and we're making good headway on the site work and the foundations. Next slide. After the concrete slab cured and the crane truck came on site, after carefully maneuvering around an existing tree, we have all kinds of crazy photos around this tree um, and working around this tree. Uh, we're uh, lifting the steel parts into the footings and we're getting bolted and welded together. Um, you can see that frame there in the lower right hand side. Um, it's the primary component for the structure that'll help resist a seismic event. And we're celebrating the topping out of the mass timber structure uh, for the rest of this building later this week. Next slide, please. The project team visited the Timber Lab factory um, and were able to see some of the Holgate roof beams, beams being prepared with wood source from the North Pacific Northwest. We're lucky to be working with Timber Lab, who are mass timber industry leaders. Mass timber is a fast growing trend and we've seen a lot of maturity in the industry in the last 10 years. From designers understanding how to work with the design and design the material, contractors knowing how it fits together and the construction sequencing, and jurisdictions understanding how this material works within codes. There's a lot of benefits to mass timber. It's a highly sustainable product that has a low carbon footprint. Mass timber is a structurally sound option that performs well during seismic activity and uh, fire resist has fire resistance properties that meet or exceed fire code requirements. We can also see reduced construction timelines due to prefabrication and addressing clash issues prior to being on site. And of course, the wood as an, the wood as an aesthetic is quite nice. Timber Lab was competitively procured on a number of our projects. Next slide, please. There's no overall, there's no changes to the overall schedule. Construction is progressing well and we expect to be done with construction next spring. Next slide, please. And there were no changes to the budget in the last quarter. Next slide. Uh, moving on to Midland, it, which adds about 6,000 square feet and majorly upgrades the existing structure. Next slide, please. Construction began this winter. We're continuing with electrical under the slab and overhead installation, and we're working on mock-ups for conduit routing and lighting attachment on the existing columns. Footing pours continue for the addition and along the south facade. We've recently reviewed furniture finishes with the furniture team, and the construction team completed the mass excavation and the clearing of the courtyard. Structural steel is, uh, has been delivered to the site and it, with installation recently started. Next slide, please. This image, this rack image, will be at the southeast corner of the building with the theme spreading across the canopy. Next slide, please. You can see all the work that's happening here at Midland where we are pouring the footings and opening up uh, that, that south facade. Next slide. And you can see we're also doing a lot of work inside with the interior slab work, uh, working on the utilities for the utilities. Next slide, please. As stated before, demolition is complete and electrical switch gear has been ordered after some late change direction from PGE. We're monitoring the ship dates for, this for the electrical switch gear closely it, due to extremely long lead times due to supply chain issues. And we're working with the move-in team to minimize impacts to the public service. Uh, upcoming milestones, we have some remaining foundations and uh, structural steel columns and brace frames in, um, in this month. Next slide, please. There are no changes to the budget, but we are tracking some pending, pending contingency usages, um, in particular for some unforeseen um, site conditions We've, we found a number of dry wells that were not on our plans in here, and then also uh, related to the PGE modifications that were required. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have Albina. Here's our exterior rendering looking down at Russell. Uh, this project renovates and seismically upgrades the historic library or the old tidal wave building and demolishes the ISIM building and garage whose service will move uh, to the op center. The result is a 30,000 square foot library plus an administrative suite. Next slide, please. The Alpina project is finalizing the design and permit process and demolition has started. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, and demolition has started. <laughs> <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, this this has been updated since you last saw it to reflect the approval of our of our decisions and to match with the June's FAC one approval by the board. The increases are related to mass timber costs, site security, exterior envelope um, as the primary drive, cost drivers. Next slide, please. This is a view showing the Black Cultural Center in the far back uh, left corner, looking down commercial from the corner of Killingsworth and commercial. This project adds two new appendages, for one for staffing and one for the new Black Cultural Center. It also seismically upgrades and renovates the historic structure. Next slide, please. The building permit was released um, recently. We're finalizing furniture plans and we're developing signage and environmental graphics. RAC is developing plans for the art procurement as we speak. Next slide, please. We are evaluating and monitoring this schedule. Due to challenges in the insurance industry, we are starting construction later than expected. We worked closely with our contractor and our internal risk management group to develop paths forward and we're now getting started on this project. This insurance issue is particularly impactful to projects that have renovation components and we're continuing to develop strategies internally and with our contractors to keep current, our current and future projects moving. Next slide, please. The budget uh, was also updated to show the additional funds from our uh, approval process and what was presented in May's FAC 1 approval by the board. Uh, the additional funds are for continued uh, market escalation and the replacement of the historic windows. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of the overall site and how it is envisioned to be developed as part of the site test fit. Next slide, please. The long anticipated property purchase closed on June 30th, followed by a groundbreaking on July 12th, thanks to those of you who were able to join us. Uh, we're entering the construction document phase while reconciling and finishing our design development cost estimates. And in a few short weeks, we'll be, able to, we'll be mobilizing on the site to start excavation and deep soil mixing to provide a more stable ground condition. Next slide, please. Just a quick view, uh, looking west, next slide. A view of the maker space, next slide, and the outdoor children's area, next slide. We have no changes to the schedule and we're still targeting uh, uh, early winter for, or midwinter for the GMP. Next slide, please. As Mike mentioned earlier, after a life cycle cost and performance analysis, our executive sponsors approved adding $1.1 million from the bond premium reserve for um, our HVAC and mechanical system. Next slide, please. Uh, Belmont planning is underway. The initial massing work with our required setbacks revealed challenges achieving uh, our target square footage. We did have a project kickoff about a week and a half ago and we're preparing, as Liz mentioned, for stakeholder and community input on the priorities regarding the historic structure, program size, parking, and a survey should be out here shortly. Next slide, please. St. John's will have a smaller addition and will kick off later this summer. Next slide, please. And with Northwest, uh, our early programming research and community engagement planning is underway. And next slide. And then the rest of the projects. <laughs> we keep going and going. Next slide, please. This graph shows the refresh portfolio over a timeline. You can see we're currently uh, working on six um, of our remaining uh, library branches. Next slide, please. Uh, Capitol Hill and Gregory Height budgets have been adjusted to balance the contingencies between these projects. Funding has been transferred to these projects for a full Cat, say, cat 6 cable replacement. And um, uh, we have funding for the smart shelf that is being piloted at Fairview. Next slide, please. I'll just very quickly go through these that we have some uh, subfloor park subpar floor conditions at Central that's being addressed and uh, we're moving forward. Next slide. Uh, we don't currently have any uh, changes to the schedule for Central, but we're monitoring it closely due to those um, unanticipated subpar flooring conditions. Next slide. Um, there are no significant changes to the 
to the budget in the last quarter, but overall there were some budget balancing activities between this and some of the smaller refreshes. Next slide. Um, we are starting uh, construction here very shortly between Capitol Hill and Gregory Heights and furniture orders have been placed and we're uh, on track to substantially complete Capitol Hill in mid-August. Next slide, please. Um, and again, no big changes here, just that we've had some minor updates. And next slide. And next slide. So uh, although we're very busy, we are also looking ahead and we are kicking off um, our next projects. We're currently in process with Fairview and Hillsdale as the, we just received the schematic design packages and the team is working through those cost estimate reconciliations. Troutdale and Kitten are next in the queue with design beginning uh, in uh, July and August and Kenton uh, kickoff is in September. Woo, okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the PMO continues to monitor and is uh, taking mitigation efforts where appropriate on our on our risk. We talked about a number of these uh, and referenced them in our in our presentation today, including market conditions, which continue to be a problem, um, impacts to the supply chain. Um, we didn't mention, but ECL switch gear is 80 weeks out. Um, so there's still some really big challenges that we're seeing here. We talked about some of the builders risk industry changes. And so those are uh, some of those big challenges that we're continuing to see. Bailey. Congratulations, Kate, that was impressive. <laughs> Um, we have like three minutes if anyone has any questions. <laughs> I'm also happy to stick around. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because I will have to uh, leave at noon, but, um, it, but I know you guys are happy to answer questions. Um, um, Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thank you. Um, and I just, before I only have a couple questions, but before um, that, I just want to say we're, I know we're not taking action on the briefing this morning, um, so that's not required. However, I want to disclose that a member of my family serves on the Community Library Capital Bond Oversight Committee. It's a volunteer position, uh, so no economic benefit to the service. So um, I just have a qu couple questions that are, I think should ne necessitate only very short answers, but if there's more, you can follow up later. Um, so under that project highlights, I'm noting that the four, there's four big ones in District 3, the Belmont, Holgate, Midlands, and Operation Centers, and it appears they're all on track, just mm -hmm. a confirmation yep. for that. Okay, great, thanks. That's an easy answer. Um, yeah. Pardon? That's an easy answer. Easy and happy answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and then on slide six, uh, there was a mention of the bond spending requirement of tax exempt um, for tax exempt bonds that 174 million needed to be spent by January 24th and just confirming you're on track uh, for hitting that spending target. Yeah, Eric Ariano, our CFO and others are monitoring that Kate is in particular and it looks as though we're on track to, to meet that requirement. Great. Um, and if the answer to to this is not yes. This question is not yes. I, you can follow up later, but um, I'm noting that there's you're moving money from the contingency funds. Obviously, that's what they're for. Um, but I'm curious about whether um, it's leaving funds are leaving the contingency funds um, at a rate that you're satisfied um, there'll be adequate contingency. Um, and if not, again, you can follow up later. Yeah, I'll let Kate. Um so the short answer is yes, and we can follow up and show you the, the controls that we have in place and the methodology that we have in place to make sure that we're not going over. Mm -hmm. Great. And this is something you can follow up with later, but um, on the diagram with the um, diversity of um, the vendors and contractors, there's the category of non-Oregon certified, fir um, certified mm -hmm. firms that are still being counted as certified workers. And I'm wondering if you could just send me the criteria that you use um, because yeah. I'm not, we're, we're to, not, to become certified, that's a, um, <laughs> it's a lengthy process. And I don't need an answer now, but if you could just send it to me. I'm just sure, I think the quick response is that we, uh, the county does only track uh, the Oregon COVID certified firms, um, but we do, uh, as a courtesy, also track the non the non-Oregon certified uh, firms, particularly as it relates to professional services, because we have a number of um, large firms that are supporting the bond program from other states that are certified in other states, but not in Oregon. 
So we just show that really as a courtesy of what that overall matrix looks like. But for the record, it is 37.8% Oregon COVID certified, and that's really what the, the, the metric that the county tracks. Yeah. Um, I'm actually just interested. Uh, thank you for the answer, but just yeah. like a more specific, like how how you get in that sl p slice of the pie? Because all the public contracting I've done, done oversight I've done, I haven't seen that category for before. So I'm just curious about what that is. But we can follow up for sure, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. And so my one substantive question is that I've heard from library staff about the concerns um, of continuing to provide. Um, to serve its mission, um, but also that the library um, serves um, in many of our neighborhoods as a public space. And um, the issues raised about physical safety of staff and library visitors, as well as um, drug use in bathrooms and um, the other associated issues um, that are in our community, but that come into our libraries because they're public spaces. And I'm curious about whether any of the um, the changes that are being made to the libraries in terms of design um, address the issues that have been raised by staff and community members using the libraries. Yeah, I will share, and we can certainly talk more about this. This is top of mind for me, and certainly something we've been looking at for years, and this this is a huge opportunity for us to address some of those through design. Um, we have been we've brought in a security expert to consult with us as these uh, projects are designed. So that's one element. We have a pretty heavy duty staff input uh, as part of the process. So they are informing us in terms of the experience of working in those spaces, things like line of sight, size of desks, all of those things that have been taken into account in terms of how these spaces are designed. And then there's the element of formal security that is a constant conversation with the county's workforce security program as well as our own lengthy expertise in how to keep these spaces safe but also welcoming. So that is definitely that is an ongoing um, priority for us and definitely these projects allow us to do some things we haven't been able to do and I think probably the biggest um, benefit is the lower shelf heights so that uh, everyone in those buildings can see across the spaces without too much impediment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, it was indeed um, comprehensive and, uh, and it uh, addressed uh, any questions that I had um, in terms of just the the uh, infrastructure itself, I had a similar question as Commissioner Brim Edwards around uh, the safety security uh, element. Uh, I also have uh, questions around, I, I really love the presentation, particularly on the, the um, technology and automation, you know, all of that stuff. And I love the makerspace and all the teen um, unit, all of these different uh, things. One question I have, again, longer conversation, but is um, the impact of sort of that automation and a lot of that stuff we're seeing that I imagine have been done um, in the past by humans, um, how that may or may not impact uh, our workforce. Yeah, definitely a longer conversation, but clearly, you know, one of the commitments I and library leadership have made from the beginning is that this is a, an effort to have a sustainable um, workforce, you know, our goal here is not to reduce employees, but to be able to provide the service this community expects with the staff staffing we have. We will have to add staff for sure. We're growing the size of the spaces, but we're hopeful that with AMH, we're able to deploy those staff in ways other than simply materials movement, which you know is it's super important, but not as engaged with the community, direct service. And um, so, and there will be plenty of opportunities to retrain staff, existing staff, and then hire in expertise, you know, that will be applied with these new kinds of programs and services. That's great. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and look forward to more conversations. Absolutely. So I think um, with that, that concludes today's briefing. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, July 27th 
at 9.30 a.m. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.